probably over 20 questions up here, which is fantastic, and we have 30 minutes to get through them. So what I'm going to ask our speakers to do is to try to answer as as briefly as they can, but still be being succinct in their answer, and then we'll go to, to the other one. Now, you don't. If somebody doesn't want to uh, have their side, they don't. They can just say, "I'm good," and we'll move on. That's fine. And what I'll do is I'll go back and forth on the pile to who they're directed to. So we're just getting back and forth and stuff here. Okay. First one is to Pastor Mike. Romans nine twenty. Why would Paul need to be saved from the law? when he says that he himself is not under the law. Romans 9.20. And I'll leave the question up here for you to check it out. Thank you. I'm just going to start by reading the text, and then I'll make my point after that. Verse 20. Let's start at verse 19. One of you will say to me, Then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, Why did you make me like this? That's Romans 9.20. Why? All right. Well, let's just start with the question. Uh, why would Paul need to be saved from the law when he says that he himself is not under the law? The Apostle Paul was under the law. The law cannot pass until every jot and tittle of the Old Covenant was fulfilled. We see that in Matthew chapter 5 verses 16 through 18. So until all those details were fulfilled, which the resurrection of the dead is a part of the law. It's one of the promises that are revealed in the law and the prophets. Therefore, until the law and the, the resurrection of the dead was fulfilled, the law and the prophets were still binding. The law was indeed still binding in that time. Yeah, in Matthew chapter 5, which Mike alluded to real quickly, uh, it says that until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished or fulfilled. And the way I understand that text is Jesus is speaking to his Jewish brethren there, Jewish followers, and telling them that in the upcoming transition period until all things are fulfilled, until the law is all accomplished, that they're going to need to keep every jot and tittle of that better than the scribes and Pharisees because the scribes and Pharisees would never, ever listen to a lawbreaker explain the gospel to them. But they would listen to a Christian who is a better lawkeeper than they are. And so Jesus tells the Christian Jews or Jewish Christians that they need to continue keeping the law, keeping every jot and tittle of it better than the scribes and Pharisees, so that the Jews would listen to them when they talk about the gospel. What Jew would shut out a Christian who is a better law keeper than they are? They wanted to know what it was about Christianity that made them such good law keepers. And so, but Paul was very adamant to keep the Gentiles free of that. Jesus revealed to Paul that the Gentiles were to not be brought under bondage to the law. And that was the tension. The Jewish Christians had to keep it better than the scribes and Pharisees, but the Gentiles didn't have to keep any of it. And that was a, that was a real conflict, and you'll see that throughout the book of Acts. But I hope that helps answer that question. Very good, and don't go far. Ed. <laughs> As full preterists, we believe in AD 70 all prophecy was fulfilled. The resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living occurred then, AD 70. So was the resurrection promised fulfilled at that time? Ed first. Ed? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's very clear that the resurrection and the transformation occurred then. And we need to keep in mind, well, then why didn't somebody see it? Why didn't somebody talk about it later? Well, because it happened in the unseen realm. What do you think happened to those living Christians when their bodies were changed? They disappeared, just like Enoch did in the Old Testament when he walked with God and he was no more, for God took him. That bodily change was taking them out of the seen visible realm 
into the unseen realm, where the dead were raised out of Hades. The dead weren't raised out of Hades and back into the physical, visible realm. They remained in the unseen realm during that resurrection event. And the living were changed and joined with them and were caught up to be with Christ forever. I just want to read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 through 23. It says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So when we're talking about the resurrection of the dead, what we're talking about is that promise, again, to Old Covenant Israel, those that were in Adam, that they their dead ones would be raised. Again, you know that when they died under the Old Covenant, you went to Sheol and Hades, and they were in that existence, and they wanted to be in the presence of God. So the, the promise is that these dead ones will be in the presence of God. The living cannot receive this beautiful reality of the presence of God without the dead ones of the Old Covenant, to whom the promises were made, they must be raised into the newness of life. They must be raised into that presence of God as well. So what we're seeing happen in the first century at the coming of the Lord, as the question pointed out that the resurrection was promised to be fulfilled at the coming of the Lord, as we see here in verse 23, that was the old covenant dead that were dead in Adam, that had that identity of dying under law. Those were the dead that were raised in AD 70. Those, the living were those that were alive. They were changed. So yes, in agreement and in, in accordance with this question here, as full preterists, we believe in AD 70 that all prophecy was fulfilled, that the resurrection of the dead, the transformation of the living, did indeed occur in AD 70. That's when the resurrection promise was indeed fulfilled. Very good. Uh, this one's for Mike. First uh, Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3. On the day of the Lord, when he came like a thief in the night, what was the experience of a believer, and what was the experience of the unbeliever? In other words, did unbelievers realize the day of the Lord had come upon them like a thief? Mike first. I like to read my Bible, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to read that verse here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 3. Now, brothers, about times and dates we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are, people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. We know that in AD 70, as the Romans came into the city of Jerusalem, we know that there were many Jews who were not aware. They did not listen to the wisdom of the Lord. They did not flee, as they were told to in Luke chapter 21. And they said, actually, the Pharisees and the religious leaders in that time, they basically told them to disregard what Jesus had said, disregard what those Christians had said in regards to a coming of the Lord, a judgment that would happen in that time. So many of the Pharisees, those religious leaders, they said, peace and safety. You're fine here. Dwell in Hold to your identity as Jews. Stay in Jerusalem. Celebrate the feast. Who cares about the wisdom of the Lord that when he said, when you see them gathering on that, you know, you see them gathering around the city of Jerusalem, flee. Don't worry about that. So, again, the believers, believers fled, went to the mountains of Pella, survived in the mountains of Pella. The unbelievers, they did. They dwelled in Jerusalem and they said, peace and safety, we're fine. Only to be scattered, brought into slavery, and destroyed as a race. What about, oh, okay, yes. So these saints that were in Thessalonica, this is being written to encourage them, particularly about the the dead ones that they had that went before them, right? Well, I'm sorry. Um, first, uh, first Thessalonians 4 is talking about those that had fallen asleep. In this text, it's talking about they don't need to be uh, unaware that the thief would come like in the night. People are saying peace and safety. Um, the saints in Thessalonica, they they would have been fine. That the judgment wasn't coming upon them in Thessalonica; it was coming upon the city of Jerusalem. So the saints in, because they're brethren and they need to be encouraged in regards to the details that are happening in Jerusalem, they would have had their eyes. Again, if you're a Gentile coming into a Jewish hope, you're still going to have your eyes set upon the Jews that are in Jerusalem because we know that that's where the coming of the Lord was going to occur. That's where all of these details were taking place within the city of Jerusalem. So those Gentiles that were in Thessalonica, they would have needed to be informed about the events that were about to happen in Jerusalem as well. Answer your question? Oh. What was the experience of a believer? What was the experience of the unbeliever? In other words, 
Did unbelievers realize the day of the Lord had come upon them like a thief? In the church at Thessalonica, as we learn from uh, the book of Acts, uh, it was made up originally of Jewish converts. Uh, and of course, it had Gentiles in there, but originally the church uh, came from mostly Jewish converts. And this letter of 1 Thessalonians was written in uh, 51 or 52 at the latest. Uh, right after, not long after, Paul had been there to convert the, the Thessalonian Christians. And so it was still probably very much Jewish in character. And so the unbelievers then would be mostly those unbelieving Jews who had persecuted the Christians there in Corinth. And did they recognize the time of Christ? visitation on them. Well, as uh, Mike pointed out, in in Jerusalem they certainly recognized that uh, God had intervened in history. Josephus says that. And even Titus, the Roman uh, general, recognized that God was the one who worked through them and through their armies to destroy the Jewish nation. So I think the unbelievers did recognize that the day of the Lord, the day, the end of days, as the Hebrew would refer to it, the end of days had come upon them. And they were not prepared. It did come upon them like a thief. Very good. Next question is for Ed. Why wasn't John raptured with the other Christians at the Perseia? Well, in a nutshell, he wasn't raptured with the other Christians because he had already died in the Neuronic persecution. Now, it's a good thing that this question was brought up because in my rapture book, I did take the position that he lived and remained until Christ returned and therefore participated in the bodily change. But I have, since then, uh, since I wrote that book 14 years ago, I have changed my position. I believe that John died in the persecution, just like his brother James did. And Jesus had told both James and John that they would both drink the cup, his cup, of martyrdom. And so I believe John also died as a martyr in the Neuronic persecution. No second answer on that one. This one's for Mike. So... So we do we still have or so we still have individual bodies in heaven question mark so I guess asking if we will have individual bodies in heaven <laughs> So what happens to us when we die um, you know the scriptures that's not the biblical narrative the biblical narrative is talking about how death the death that plagued old covenant Israel was removed through Jesus Christ um, we have this great news that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor mind has conceived the glorious things that God has prepared for us. I wouldn't pretend to know what happens to us when we biologically die. Um, do I believe we have individual bodies? Uh, no. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't believe Scripture is detailing that point. And, um, you know, I, I believe that there's a glorious existence awaiting us um, when we die biologically. However, I don't pretend, nor does it seem that Scripture alludes to uh, what that identity and what that reality would be like. So the question is, so do we still have individual bodies in heaven? Yes, we sure do. Uh, there's so many passages that teach that. Uh, Revelation, of course, shows that very thing, that there were bodied, embodied people there in heaven. Uh, but we've got all the statements uh, of, uh, of of the bodily change that we looked at today. Uh, Philippians 3.21, who will transform our lowly body into conformity with His glorious body. All of those bodily change texts very clearly teach that those living saints 
would have their bodies changed so that they could inherit the incorruptible, immortal life in heaven. It was not a disembodied, pure spirit existence like the Greeks believed. That was the whole argument Paul is making in 1 Corinthians uh, against the Greeks because they believed in a disembodied afterlife. And Paul is arguing against that, showing that the dead will be raised with incorruptible bodies and the living will have their mortal bodies changed into immortal bodies so that their afterlife will be in an embodied form. So, yes, uh, we still have individual bodies in heaven. One of the texts is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, uh, where he says, uh, we have. He says, if this physical body that we have here on earth, he says, verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, for we know, he doesn't say we speculate, we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It's reserved up there for us. When this body is gone, we get that new body. Okay, this question is for Ed. Jesus ministered to people in death. The people who had died had no body, just a consciousness or life soul. How did they survive with no body? If they did not need a body, why would we need one in heaven? Head first. I'm going to read that again, make sure I understand it right. Uh, Jesus ministered to people in death. I think that's reference to 1 Peter chapter 3 and chapter 4, I assume. Uh, the people who had died had no body. That's correct. Just a consciousness of life or soul. How did they survive with no body? Well, uh, this is the debate that the annihilationists have always had with the traditional uh, church that teaches the eternal conscious punishment idea. So uh, this is the, uh, the idea that the annihilationists that I've had interaction with, every one of them redefines immortality. Instead of immortality being a quality of the body in our afterlife, they define immortality as a quality of the soul which is consciousness of the soul not a quality of the body and so it's that definition of terms that that is causing the confusion here in this debate between the annihilationist and the eternal conscious punishment views how do they survive with no body? Well, it's, it's easy because the soul is always conscious. Well, how do I know that? Because in Luke chapter 20, uh, uh, Jesus interacts with some Sadducees, and the Sadducees were, were annihilationists. And they would agree with this definition of immortality being mere soul consciousness. And they would they would deny, just like the annihilationists do today, that when the body is separated from the soul, the soul is no longer conscious. It goes into a unconscious soul sleep idea. But that's not the definition that the Bible gives for immortality. Immortality is far more than just consciousness of the soul. It is a quality of the new body that we get. The soul is conscious, but that's not immortality. That's just consciousness of the soul. In Luke chapter 20, in his answer to the Sadducees, yeah, Luke 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 34 through 38. Notice he says, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from out of the dead ones 
neither marry or are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, he says, verse 37, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Verse 38, now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. That's whether they're righteous or unrighteous. All live to him. That's soul consciousness, even though they were in Hades at that time. Okay, this is questions for Mike, and this actually has it. Two questions on here. I'm just going to get one because we've got a large stack over here. Is a combination of CBV and IBV possible? Did a process occur at a point in history, example, a 70 AD rapture of living Christians, which from then on continues in a spiritual sense for individuals through history? No. Um, the reason being is that the text that we're using to, again, I'm offering that the resurrection that was hoped for throughout the Law and the Prophets was a resurrection of the dead ones, corporate Old Covenant Israel that was designated to Hades. I'm arguing that their hope was that they would be released from that Hadean realm. The same text that I'm using to show you that reality, 2 Corinthians chapters 3-5, through 5, Romans chapter 8, Philippians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 John chapter 3, these texts that I'm arguing are offering up a resurrection of the dead are the same verses and texts that Mr. Stevens would use to argue for an individual body resurrection. So there can be no combination of the two because we're using, two, we're using the same text to argue different points. So that's where that, that combination does not work. Now, to answer the second part of that question, did a process occur at a point in history, AD 70 rapture of living Christians, which from then on continues in a spiritual sense? I believe that in AD 70, that the dead ones that were in Hades, Old Covenant dead Israel, that needed to be raised out of the dead in order to fulfill the law and the prophets, I believe they were raised out of the dead. I believe the living that were surviving in the mountains of Pella were encouraged, were changed, were edified, empowered by that resurrection. They knew the reality of that resurrection when they seen the coming of the Lord. They knew that the dead ones were indeed raised because we believe in Jesus Christ. So now that we see the coming of the Lord, we're surviving in the mountains. We're going to be changed, empowered, encouraged, going from one mind to another. And then I also believe that that allows us the reality that we have eternal life, that we live forever with God. Now, we live here. We're with him, being emboldened by everything that happened in AD 70, being empowered by the reality of the coming of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead. And now we continue in that life, that we continue in that bodily existence of the body of Christ. So while you're alive here in the body of Christ, I do believe you'll be alive after biological death in the body of Christ. Now, I don't pretend to know what that identity or reality would be like after biological death. I do believe that that continues. So, I do believe there's a continuation of that resurrection reality after biological death. However, I wouldn't use the same verses, or I wouldn't use any verses that we're using here to argue for that position. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, similar to what I would say uh, with this addition. Um, I agree that that Old Covenant Israel was raised out of its deadness into the New Covenant. So it, it's not so much a conceptual difference. It's a question of which passages we apply to that covenantal or collective concept as opposed to which ones we apply to the individual body concept. That's where the differences are. Uh, the collective body guys would apply 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5 to their collective body concept. Uh, I don't disagree with their concept. I just disagree with their interpretation of those texts as being applied to that concept. And also, Mike and I and all the individual and collective body guys use the same terminology and use the same text, but we define those terms differently. When he says the dead were raised out of Hades, 
I'm not quite sure he means exactly the same thing I do when I talk about the dead ones being raised out of Hades. He may define, and maybe not, but Mike may define the word Hades differently than I do, and he may define the dead ones differently than I do. I know that. Uh, I know the dead ones are the old covenant Israel, uh, as opposed to the all of the dead ones who were in Hades. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind as you try to understand these different views. Recognize that we're using the same text and the same terms, but we define those terms differently and we interpret those texts differently. Okay, just a few minutes left. Let's try to get a couple more in here. This one is to Ed. It says, if we can dismiss the present tenses of the verbs concerning the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, why can't we dismiss the future tenses in the same chapter also? Ed, to start. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think uh, we are dismissing that at all. I don't think... Uh, Michael dismissed it, and I don't think I dismiss that. We're taking those terms very seriously. Very, We go right to the grammar, as I pointed out. Uh, Machen and uh, several other Greek grammars deal with this very terminology, uh, the, the present tense, the present passive indicative of uh, egiro there in 1 Corinthians 15. And it... Uh, I mean, it's not a fair thing to say that I'm dismissing that language at all. Not at all. Uh, it, you'd have to make that same accusation against 95% of the translators in our New Testament because they all translate it the way I'm talking about. And we'd have to uh, charge all the grammarians, the Greek grammarians, with error as well and saying that those guys who have studied Greek language all of their life are dismissing this terminology? No, I don't think so. Not at all. We're not dismissing it. We're just interpreting it the way the first century saints would have understood it. And that's all. I mean, there's differences of opinion about how we interpret that language and how we define those terms. Uh, but you look at the people who are translating these terms, and when 95% of them translate it a certain way, uh, that ought to make us cause, that ought to be cause for pause in trying to assign a new or different meaning to it uh, because these guys have spent their whole life dealing with these terms. I just want to make two quick points about this question. Uh, the first thing would be, um, I, I happen to believe that we could pick up an English Bible and we could ascertain proper doctrine from an English Bible. I don't believe anybody in this room has to be Hebrew or Greek scholars to understand the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, especially if that's the gospel that the Apostle Paul was preaching. I don't believe you have to be a Hebrew or a Greek scholar to understand those things. So the present tense, passive tense, not a Greek scholar, not going to pretend to try to do that. Um, when we're reading through the text of 1 Corinthians 15, I, I had heard uh, Mr. Stevens speak a couple times in regards to... Uh, that this could not be an ongoing reality, that it, it was coming at the day of the Lord. I believe that the dead ones in the Hadean realm were raised at the day of the Lord. There's two resurrections that we read about in Scripture. Revelation chapter 20 highlights them. There were those that were coming to life, reigning with the Lord during the thousand years, the millennium. Not going to go there, don't worry. Um, however, uh, you know, there were those that were coming to life during that time. And I would say that that is the soteriological resurrection, those that were putting their faith in Christ, moving from death to life. However, the resurrection of the dead ones that we're specifically doing this exchange in regards to happen at the coming of the Lord. That was a future event during the writing of 1 Corinthians 15. And as Mr. Stevens pointed out, that, that is not something that was ongoing. That is something that happened at the coming of the Lord. So I didn't understand a lot of the present and passive tense stuff that was going on earlier because I kept saying to myself, I believe that the resurrection of the dead ones happened at the coming of the Lord, just as the text points out. Well, we're out of time. Uh, there are a number of questions we did not get to. So uh, Ed mentioned to me before that he wants to answer, Ed and Mike want to answer the questions to them. So if your question was not answered, it's up here on, on this table. If you can come up and put your name on it or your email. Some of you already did, but some of you didn't. Find your question, put your name and email 
those questions will be answered uh, at that time. Or you can speak with them during the break and uh, ask them personally. But I uh, want to thank, thank the two speakers again for their great presentations and their answers to your questions. And I really appreciate all you guys uh, coming for this. I'm hoping that you're learning something, that you're getting your questions answered, and like me, uh, coming to a better understanding of opposing views. I mean, it's been very helpful for me to get to know the uh, covenant creation and the uh, collective body view better. I mean, that's uh, that was the whole purpose of this, and I'm sure Michael uh, shares that. Uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, it's, it's great to get to know each other's view. That's what debaters really should do. Before they ever sit down and debate, they should sit down over a cup of coffee or a meal or two or three meals over a week and have each other explain their views to each other so that when they're all done explaining it, they can repeat it back to the other person and, and that person will say, that's exactly what I believe. And too many debaters never do that. Consequently, they just talk past each other. They never connect. And I'm determined if I ever have a debate, I will not agree to it until we sit down and explain our views to each other and understand them very well. Otherwise, we are wasting our time and just making a divisive uh, situation. And we don't need to do that. We don't need any more confusion. We need clarity.